idea that wells are feature a lot in the Bible. You, uh, you know that lots of stuff, particularly in the Old Testament, happened around wells. We know that uh, Abraham sent his servant to go and find uh, his, a wife for his son and he's at the well, he's at, waiting and he prays this amazing prayer and that's how he finds Rebecca. So lots of things. We know that Moses, when he's on the run, he meet, he's at a well. We know that so much goes on. You could do your own study and that's what I tell people when I uh, do my broadcast and I'll tell you now, do your own study. Do Start Googling. I mean, we used to have Cruden's Concordance. We've now got Google Concordance, haven't we? It's a lot quicker, actually. And it'll come up loads of scriptures about wells and so forth. So wells, in one of the things the wells were in the Bible was that they were landmarks. They were, uh, there were places where oaths were taken. There were uh, covenants were made. And, but where I'm going today is in more in the metaphoric sense of wells. And so the, the metaphoric use of wells or water, it comes up again. So I'm going to turn to Jeremiah 2, if you want to turn to that. Wonderful. But Jeremiah, this is a really sort of kind of scary scripture. And I'm reading from the, this particular verse from the ESV. To Jeremiah 2 and verse 13 says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken the fountain of living waters, i.e. the well, and they've hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. We know that was true for the people, God's people then, and we know that Jeremiah was the unpopular prophet told them that all this stuff would happen to them, but, but it did happen to them. And they ended up in captivity. And But we do that, don't we? We try and hew out systems for ourselves. We, that's what the world does. It's anything, the old saying, anything but Christ, the ABC of the enemy, anything but Christ. And we try and try and satisfy that deep, longing that God put in our hearts. He's put eternity in our hearts. And if that if we try and satisfy it with anything but what will what will only truly satisfy. But in Isaiah 12, which is a wonderful hymn, and I love Isaiah 12 and you 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 can check that out. But in verse 3, it, and this is like Isaiah 12 is a hymn looking forward. It starts with, in that day. Which day is that? Well, well, I guess when Jesus finally comes back. But it could be in this not now kingdom that's the breaking in. In that day. In that day. And you'll rejoice. And it says in verse 3, it says, Therefore with joy shall you draw waters from the wells of salvation. Wow. That looking, it's definitely looking into the day that we're living in now, that we, that God has placed something inside of us that we can draw those wells with joy. And we can draw water from the wells of salvation. And there's one right there in the Red Book of Revelation, Revelation 7, 17. And it says this, it says that this is the, the people, I believe, a picture of all the people of God that have come through all the different stuffs, all the pandemics and plagues and persecutions and have endured to the end and been faithful to Jesus. Amen. And it says in verse... 17 for and this is from the uh, Naz version it says the lamb in the for the lamb in the center of the throne will be their shepherd who will guide them to springs of water of the water of life so there is this in eternity this drinking from him and, and God will wipe away every tear 
from their eyes. Every tear, and there's been some tears in these last 12 months, been some frustrations. God will wipe away every tear. But there's probably the most well-known one is in the Gospel of John. And you know, if you know your Bibles, you know where I'm going with this. And it's John chapter 4. And, and it, there's a, it, I'm not going to preach on this. But it is where Jesus sits on Jacob's well, at the side of Jacob's well. And he, he's, he's alone. He's thirsty. And along comes this woman. And he asks for a drink. And out of that comes this dialogue. And by the way, it's interesting, isn't it? In the days, that, particularly now that we're living in, that the dialogue comes up again and again. You see people, we have a dog, so we engage with the dog walkers. And so, you know, people say, how are you doing? And everybody will say, we're so glad when this thing's over. And... So there is this openness in this woman and Jesus, he ends up telling her all about her life and she go, runs back to uh, her own village and preaches the gospel. She's the first evangelist and Jesus follows and loads of people turn and start following Jesus. But he says this in verse 14 from the NIV. But whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I want to tell you, if, if for those of us who are following Jesus, Christians are walking wells. We are carriers of the living water of God. We have something that will re that refresh our communities, our towns, our villages. We have something that will refresh everyone around them. It says, springing up and welling up to eternal life. It says you'll never thirst, but I don't believe that you'll never thirst again in that sense. What Jesus is saying is that we will, once you've tasted... Once you've tasted his water, anything else doesn't match. So we'll still, who's still thirsty for God? We're still thirst after God and we still, who wants more? We still want more. But we will never, we, once you've tasted of heaven, you don't want this earth. The old chorus member, it's, well, some of you, you're all too young. But, it says, but the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. I'll never thirst. Uh, there's nothing in this world. You know, I've never read a, no, uh, a novel in a book. I've never. I can't get into it. You see, I was, God taught me to read through, by reading the Bible because I was almost illiterate. So the only book, first book I ever read was the Bible. And then I love to read now. And as you can see, I do. I love to read. I love to study. But I can't get into novels because it's not true. It's somebody else's thoughts. It's somebody else's head. Nothing, nothing will, nothing touches me. Because I've drunk and I've tasted. And within me is that well of living water springing up to eternal Life. Of course, that connects also with my ministry text, which is John 7 and 38. It says, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And the words on, the, on this here is an acronym of the word rivers. That carrying in us there is revival, intimacy, victory. And all of these concepts, uh, there is the equipping. God equips us and we're able to equip others. There is that reality. It's real. It's not religious. There is that simplicity. And this is all inside of us. So, okay, 
best to open the Bible. Best, best to use the, the rest of the time well. So I'm, to, I'm opening my Bible to Genesis 26 and verses 12. So if you want to follow that, you can. And there's this conflict at the well. Conflict at the well. There is a contending over some wells that we're going to just unpack in these brief moments that we have together. So picking up on verse 12 and it says, Isaac planted crops in the land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. What a pointless thing. But you know, envy and jealousy is always destructive. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. You see, they would have drunk from these wells themselves. They would have gone to these wells. They would have used these wells. But they cut off their nose to spite their face because they, were, they, they hated the, that he'd prospered and he'd got on. They hated that God's hand was upon him. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gera, where he settled. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug at that time of his father Abraham. This is the NIV. I love this sort of very polite, he reopened the wells. It's like you can hear David Suchet reading this, can't you? It's so nice. It's so pleasant. It re, re, he literally, you know, it sounds to me when I read this, it's like, like a garden fate somewhere where you cut the ribbon and the, the fate is now declared open. Now it was a bit more than that. They got their hands dirty, they started some effort and they started digging out the soil so that the well could be functional again. They re-dug the well and I want you to get that thought in your mind to re-dig the well. Redig the well. He reopened the wells his father dug and Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up. And after Abraham died, he gave them the names his father had given them. Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. But the herders of Gear quarrelled with those of Isaac and said, the water is ours. So we named it Isaac because they disputed with him. Then they dug another well and they quarreled over that one also and he named it Sitna. He moved from there and dug another well and no one quarreled over it and he named it Rehoboth saying, now the Lord has given us room and we will flourish in the land. Prod Isaac is pushed from pillar to post. He is, he's very passive, isn't he? He's very sort of turn the other cheek. He's very almost Christ-like because to actually dig or put soil into these wells was an act of war, an act of aggression, but he walks away. Sometimes we've got to walk away. Sometimes we've got to, as, as one regional minister said to me in the Baptist circles that I moved in, he said, keep your powder dry. Sometimes you've got to know when not to engage, especially on social media with all the debates going on and all the stuff. Sometimes you've just got to walk away, put a big smile on your face and say, God bless you. Sometimes it's not an argument worth winning. He who runs away will live to fight another day. So we see this. He's moved on and he's moved on. But they are redigging the wells until in the end they come to this place of Rehoboth. 
And God is making room for us, isn't he? God is bringing, you know, we've been moved around, locked down, not locked down. You can go to church, you can't go to church. You can do this, you can do that. But okay, each time the church of Jesus worldwide creatively finds ways of getting the message out. And God's making room. People are getting saved. People are finding Christ. It's wonderful, isn't it? In the times that we're living in. They're not very pleasant times, but they're wonderful times because God is working. He's never stopped working. And uh, there's that modern song that we, we sing, that, we, that even, even when I don't feel it, he's working. Even when I don't see it, he's working. God's working in the midst of it. You see, the, the Philistines were so angry and jealous about the way God's people were being blessed that they decided to fill in the well out of envy and spite. Uh, and people will do that. This sadly happens in church life. Sadly. And people will... When people come into something, when they, when they come into, well, what, what does he know? What does she know? And there's that putting in the earth, there's that trying to damp down the flame to go into the other metaphor. But we need to um, fast forward to the time of Jesus. And we go back to that text that we looked at just now. It says, that in John 4, 14, whoever drinks of the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So if, if, you, can, if you can block up natural wells, you can block up the spiritual well. There is an enemy that would seek to block. You say, oh, I, I'm feeling dry. I don't know where God is. And well, maybe there's a bit of soil been tipped into your well. Maybe the water's not flowing as it, as it once did. God wants it to. You see, Jesus had to go to the cross in death. And this is the Easter message, isn't it? He goes to the cross. He takes he, he, the great exchange. He took your sin and my sin. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He forgives us. He cleanses us. And we get filled with his spirit. And that living water that we become walking wells. And we see how the earth, that this is what happened. Jesus said this to the woman here, but then he goes through his earthly ministry, goes to the cross, and, and then on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes, and there's these 120 bubbling over wells with the power of God. And the church, the church of Jesus, the, the Messianic community, exploded on the scene with first of all 3,000 then 5,000 and it grows and grows and what happens is envy and anger come from religious people from political people and you'll follow it all the way through the book of Acts a God move there's a move forward and then the enemy comes in in whatever form he doesn't care what he doesn't care what political party it is. He doesn't care what religious thing it is. As long if he can put some dampening soil to dam up your well, he will. And we see this all the way through. And again, you know, we see with Paul and they're beaten up, but instead they just turned into a praise party. They get the soil out of their hearts and they keep praising, and the water keeps flowing, the wells keep bubbling up. Oh, uh, but we see kingdom growth. But in time, we see the enemy puts soil in the wells to block them up. John 10.10, 10, you probably know it. The thief comes to rob, to kill and destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly or to the full. 
You could re reread that. The thief comes to put soil in the well. For I am come that you might have life. The enemy has been there. We, if you like church history, you'll see church history and you see how you, you look at some of the doctrines. How on earth did we get to that? But it was the soil, the dirt of the enemy pouring into this well because he knows if he can stop or slow down the church. He's trying to stop us. But God, through history, sent people to redig the wells. I wonder if I'm talking to some rediggers today. I wonder if I'm talking to some people who know how to redig some wells. And it has to start with us. It has to start in a local church. It has to start in, and, and it goes on. We see that uh, that example. People like Luther. He was a well digger, a redigger. Calvin was a redigger. Wesley Whitfield. The list goes on. They bring in the people back to the Word of God. Bring in the people back. To be in those walking wells. Finney, Moody, Billy Graham, to mention a few well diggers. And the world has been blessed with an, a number of the moves of God. Who wants to see a move of God? Who wants to see a fresh move? Well, the, and I love following. Uh, some of the books on here about the revival, uh, revivals, plural. And God wants to bring revival. This is why I'm really pleased of the acronym on here. Revival. God wants to bring constant living revival. It says the lamp in the temple should never go out. The fire in the temple should never go out on the sacrifice. Never go out. He wants to bring us in to, li to live in that revival zone. So, and in these moves, you can maybe think of your own. You can write your own notes. But there's a Zuzi Street and the Pentecostal outpouring. There is what happened here in Bradford. There is what happened in, in Wales, the uh, Welsh revival. And it goes on, what happened in the 50s in, in the Hebrides. The, the, these were great moves of God. And the, 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 there's been others more recent. You don't mention too, too many of them because you've always got the... The people who want to throw some soil on it and I don't agree with that particular one. It can't be a real one because it's only when the people are long since dead that you can agree with it. I'm going to tell you for all these moves of God and even the stuff that's happening now, they've always been preceded by well diggers. What am I saying? Well, people who pray. See, when we pray... We're preparing the way. This is a kind of a John the Baptist ministry, preparing the way of the Lord, digging out the wells. Let be well diggers in our society. To bring with a lot about social justice at the moment, and so there should be. But we need people who will speak up for the unborn as well. And there's so many issues. To be well diggers. But I want to say that if in our personal walk with God we find we're dry, maybe it's time to redig our own well. So 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 6. Familiar verses. To those who are well versed in scriptures. If you're just starting out. Maybe not so. But it says. But I remind you says Paul to Timothy. To stir up or fan into flame. The gift of God. That, which is in you. Through the laying on of my hands. It could read. I therefore remind you. To redig the well. Or Ephesians 5, 14, where Paul says, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It could read, Awake, O sleeper, redig the well, 
rise from the dead, redig the well, and Christ's light will shine on you. Or what about 1 Corinthians 14? By the way, I'm reading these verses out because they are part of my daily devotion. I try and live in these. These are my zones. 1 Corinthians 14, 1. After the great love chapter, in the love chapter of 1 Corinthians 13, which some people say, oh, forget 1 Corinthians 12, you know, and the gifts. Let's pursue, you know, it's love that's all, all that matters. Well, yeah, surely is. But if you really love the body of Christ and you really love this world, you'll ask him to fill him with, with his spirit and operate in all the gifts of the spirit. But it says in, one, in 14 and verse 1, it says, pursue love. Pursue love. And earnestly, ardently desire spiritual gifts that you may prophesy. You know, that could read. Pursue love. Earnestly desire spiritual gifts. Redig the well. What about Romans 12 too? Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It could read. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by redigging the well. So what can block our human wells? Here's a short list. And we'll close with this. Perhaps hopelessness. You see, I, I, the enemy in, the, in our story in Genesis, and that's our backdrop, isn't it? They shove soil into the wells and they do it as quickly as they can. But it doesn't always happen quickly, does it? If you've ever done a bit of gardening or a bit of landscaping and you haven't quite finished and you've got it all nice, the edges and everything. And then you come the next day and all that soil's gone back down. And it happens over a period of time. And hopelessness. This has been a year of hopelessness for many. This has been a year when soil has gone in. Oh, not another lockdown. Not another, not another situation. Oh. And we, there's so much now about mental health. Hopelessness. Unforgiveness is another area. If we hold on, I'm not to, and in that attitude of unforgiveness towards others, the only person you're hurting is yourself. And the soil goes in and the waters stop flowing. Or bitterness. We live in a victim mentality world, don't we? It was them. But what, Christians are not victims. Christians are victors. We are overcomers. And when, if bitterness comes, I've been bitter in my life. I've had stuff. But you know, when it comes, I start, I'm not having that in my well. Or judgmental attitude. You see, you can disagree with stuff, but not be judgmental. You, you have two extremes. You have the, the judgmental, turn or, turn or burn society. Or you've got the love, 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 love. You know, God loves you no matter what you do. And they're both wrong. I disagree with lots of things, but I'm not going to allow that to become a judgmental attitude. Because once it does, there's a bit more soil comes in. Or simply a lack of thirst. We stop. We stop drinking. We stop hungry. We stop thirsting. Well, all that can stop today, because we can we say, "Search me, O God, with King David, 
in that wonderful psalm of 139 and verse 23. Search me, O oh God, and know my anxiety. Know what soil is in my well. That's Freddie Brooks paraphrased. And lead me in the way that is ever.